in my opening line here, good afternoon and thank you for coming. From the 1890s until the mid-1970s, the Grain Belt Brewery was the heartbeat of this neighborhood and the focal point of the community. It was one of the neighborhood's biggest employers. It produced the best-selling beer in the state. It was, at one point, the 18th largest brewer in the country, and it was a popular tourist attraction, especially after the scenic park was opened right outside here on the Broadway side of the brewery. But in 1975, a local businessman took it over and essentially ran it into the ground. The following year, 350 jobs were gone. The equipment was auctioned off mostly for scrap. And the buildings were boarded up with the possibility of demolition looming. Now what we have here, this is an old uh, pamphlet that they uh, handed out back in the early 70s. So, And that's the way... It was when I moved into this neighborhood in 1993. The brewery had been closed for just under 20 years at that point, and I used to walk down to the boarded up old brew house and imagine the way things were and wondered what it looked like inside. I had been interested in the Grain Belt Brewery and Grain Belt Advertising since I was a kid and it was still a popular brand in my earliest years. Here's what remained <clears throat> of Grain Belt Park at that time. That pipe sticking out of the ground in the center of the picture, that was the, that was the original perfect brewing water fountain that you used to see depicted in the old ads and the labels for Grain Belt and with, you know, during the 1960s and 1970s. That was all that was left. Now, all that was later taken out, and they got, there's kind of a replica fountain out there now, but that's what remained of the original fountain there with the landscaping and the rocks and all that. Uh, here's what the Marshall Street side looked like. In 1999, I finally got to get in on a tour of the brew house uh, conducted by the Minneapolis Community Development Agency, which owned the property at the time, and I got to see the interior, still essentially frozen back in time to the mid-1970s. It's a good thing I got in when I did, because it was shortly after that that Ryan Companies and RSP Architects teamed up to completely renovate the interior and turned it into world headquarters for the architect firm. Here's a few shots of what it looked like when I went through in 1999. There were ornamental iron staircases, mysterious narrow doorways, a few pieces of equipment in the engine room, and a laboratory with part of the Grain Belt logo still on the wall. Here's the old control board. You know, this is part of that tour in 1999 when we went through there. You can see everything is pretty much trash, but that's, and then you can see the people from the MCDA tour going up the stairs and all that, but that's what that, that's what the old control board looked like. Go with it. And that's what it looked like when it was operational from a uh, company magazine back in 1968. There were giant holes in the floor where the brew kettles used to be, and then that was another thing. We all had to sign a waiver when we went through it because an accident could easily happen. But, you know, if you've seen brewery pictures of giant brew kettles, and then there was part of the uh, staircase there. But that's what it looked like in 1939. It's the farther one, though, the hole that you saw in the previous picture, that would have been the farther one. There you see that same staircase there, and then this is another brew kettle that was there, but this is... Uh, from uh, an old uh, 1939 company magazine. There's even a full-size 24-sheet Green Belt Guys billboard from the company's last ad campaign in 1975. I had already published my book, Legend of the Brewery, before going on this tour, so I had the pleasure of bringing copies of the book inside the brewery itself along with some of my Grain Belt memorabilia collection, some of which is in those display cases out there right now. Um, and, but one regret that I have about publishing the book when I did, and like I say, the book's right here, um, is that uh, right afterwards so much more took place, and I also found a lot more information on the history of the brewery than I had at the time. But even 20 years later, people are still buying and enjoying the book. So in this presentation, we'll uncover a few nuggets I didn't have at the time. The story of the Grain Belt Brewery starts with a John Orth Brewery established in 1850. The location of the Orth Brewery was right across from Marshall Street 
adjacent from the current brew house structure. This would be over where the apartments are. The courtyard in front of the apartments over there outlines the footprint of the original Orth Brewery. And if you go over there, you'll find some information about the Orth Brewery and Grain Belt. Here's an ad for the John Orth Brewing Company from the 1889 Minneapolis City Directory. Let me take a look at that for a moment. In 1891, the Orth Brewery merged with three other Minneapolis breweries, the Heinrich Brewing Association, F.D. Norenberg, and Germania Brewing Company, to form what was first called the Minneapolis Brewing and Malting Company. Uh, Gottlieb Glick, whose brewery was up a few blocks on Marshall Street, was given the opportunity to be part of this merger, but he chose to stay independent. This page is from the 1891 city directory and it was pretty brittle when I took a picture of it. Thus, you see there are some chunks uh, chipped away, like uh, for instance, the B in brewing is uh, missing on that page. The brew house that stands today was soon built and it was considered then to be state of the art in the industry. In 1893, the company was reorganized and the name was shortened to Minneapolis Brewing Company. And you can take a look, this is kind of uh, from the 13th Avenue side of the, uh, the brewery there. You can see how it looked and you can see some in that uh, engraving, you can see some horse-drawn wagons in the street and whatnot. And then the, the night names of the beer, they didn't have grain belt yet at that time. They had a uh, Wiener, Kaiser, Lager, and Extra Pale, pretty uh, generic sounding names at that time that they were advertising as the queen of all table beers. And note the telephone number, 486 is the phone number. <laughs> 1893 was, in fact, a big year for the company. It was the year that Golden Grain Belt beer was introduced. The name Grain Belt referred to the geographical area from which it came. Uh, America's Grain Belt, as they called it, where grain fields covered much of the land. Early labels depicted a golden field of grain under blue skies inside the famous diamond-shaped logo. And here, a couple of distinguished gentlemen enjoy some. Yeah, well, they had, they had different varieties. That's probably a dark bottle, too, and that's probably a brown bottle. But Although, yeah, I guess the, in the glasses, yeah, it does look like... But they had, they had different varieties at the time as well. Um, which you'll see in some of these old ads. It was also in 1893, August 13th, that a fire that started as stable on Nicollet Island ignited nearby lumber yards and quickly grew out of control, spreading all the way down the western side of Marshall Street, <clears throat> making its way to the new Minneapolis Brewing Company complex, destroying a malt house, three bottling houses, a pitch, yard and a barn, as this was in the days when deliveries were made by horse-drawn wagons. There was only minimal damage to the main brew house, however, due to the fire-resistant structure and a wind shift. The company's loss was reported to be at $117,000, which in 1893 was a pretty good fortune there. And this uh, is a reprint from a microfilm of the newspaper, Minneapolis Tribune, from August 14th, 1893. And here you see the fire in full force as it approached the brewery. This picture, courtesy of the Minnesota Historical Society, is particularly interesting because it shows the south end of the brew house before the 1903 addition facing Broadway Avenue was built. One wonders if that painted sign is still underneath. You also see some rather haunting faces of people who lived in this neighborhood 125 years ago. The fire was only a temporary setback. The company had insurance, and the Minneapolis Brewing Company continued to grow and expand into the turn of the 20th century. And I'll let you look at this for a moment, but you can see some of these huge buildings that were destroyed there. But there's there's the brew house right there. Well, what were the fire departments like? They, uh, they well, they didn't have powerful fire engines. They had to come on horse and uh, with tanks of water and hoses. So, like I say, this thing that fire had started. 
back at Nicollet Island and spread and there and in fire city fires were kind of a common thing in those days because they couldn't put them out so quickly. Of course, it was the famous Chicago fire and the cow knocked over the lamp and the whole uh, city went up in flames. So here's a very early grain belt ad engraved on the cover of the 1897 edition of the city directory called Dual City Blue Book. It was the upper crusts who had their names and businesses listed in the blue book and grain belt was advertised as the beers of society. Not quite the reputation they came to be known for. And here's a lithograph advertising Minneapolis Brewing Company's Bach beer, depicting two goats pulling a cart through a grain field, carrying a maiden holding a flag and a grain belt diamond shield. The flag says, Northwestern beer brewed from Northwestern grain for Northwestern people. So you can see in the, those early lithographs, they had a lot of a lot of detail there in the early uh, early days of color printing. So we are Northwestern right here? Yeah, well, yeah, from Northwestern, from uh, uh, from Chicago or St. Louis. Okay. And I think later this region came to be better known as the Midwest, although even well into the 20th century, we had Northwestern National Bank was located in Minneapolis. Uh, Channel 4 used to call themselves Television 4, the Great Northwest. Schmidt Beer, a competitor of Grain Belt, was the, the brew that grew with the Great Northwest. So, I mean, this region was still referred to as the Northwest a lot well into the 20th century. Okay, where are we now? <clears throat> Here are some rare scenes showing some brewery operations in the late 19th century. The Keg House, the bottling house and a horse-drawn wagon delivering grain belt beers. I'll let you take a look at that for a moment. I was told to kind of slow down the presentation so people can linger on some of these pictures a little bit longer rather than just speeding through them all. So the is still there. Yeah, that's where Bunnies is now. And the bottling house, that's across 13th Avenue. And then the old horse drawn leg in there. All right. Here's an early wooden grain belt case holding 24 bottles. You can see kind of how primitively painted that was. Here's a city directory ad from 1896 for another beer made at the brewery called Gilt Edge. You can see a depiction of the brewery as it looked at the time from the northeastern corner. So I'll let you look at this for a moment. Uh, $3 a case, and if, if, well, $3 if the case is returned. Of course, everything was returnable in those days. They just reused the, and here the uh, more advanced telephone number, 1172 is the phone number there. <clears throat> and back in those days too, um, you could buy beer directly from the brewery. After Prohibition, at least in Minnesota, you can't buy, well, this might have changed with uh, the craft breweries out now and the brew pubs, but it used to be you couldn't buy directly from the brewery. You have this whole, that's why you have these distributors. You can buy, you can purchase beer from the distributor or from the retailer purchase from the distributor, but not directly from the brewery. But back then you could order from the brewery and they deliver it right to your home. So, yeah. <clears throat> Another beer made by Minneapolis Brewing Company was, I think this is pronouncing this right, Zumelweiss. This is actually a cover for sheet music published in 1914 for a song about Zumelweiss, Zoom, 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 a Stein song, that you could sing while beering away the hours by the old piano. And of course, the bars used to have pianos and live entertainment before you had ESPN and all that and jukeboxes came before ESPN, etc. But uh, pianos used to be popular in bars, and you know a lot of a lot of companies would advertise because there's no television. A lot of companies would advertise uh, with sheet music. You know, it's kind of a precursor to uh, the commercial jingle. <clears throat> Here, a baseball-themed 1910 newspaper ad for Grain Belt, complete with health claims. Note the two-digit telephone number here, 33, both phones. Uh, and three different kinds of grain belt, extra pale, original, and gilt edge. 
No premium or Nordeast back then, and certainly nothing blueberry flavored. <laughs> A quick thought, responsive muscles. These qualities are dependent upon good health, and athletes know the great value of good beer as a healthful builder of tissues wasted by exertion. It also makes you very clumsy when you're trying to slide into base, too. Okay. And here are some pre-prohibition grain belt beer bottles, some with the original paper labels. The two on the ends with the cork stoppers are from about 1900 or before. The others are from roughly 1910 to 1915, but all are over a century old now. And then you can see I was describing the early labels had the grain field inside the logo. There you see a couple of examples of that. And here, in an old Time Life book about the Old West, the series they used to advertise on TV back in the 70s, you might remember the, 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 the covers with simulated hand tool leather and all that. In one of those books, I, I happened to be looking through it, and I discovered an early grain belt bottle next to a bottle of slow gin in an old photo that was said to be taken at a ranch in Montana. And grain belt was indeed sold, sold that far out in the prairie states back then. But here's the original picture, and then I did the close-up where you can see the grain belt bottle, similar to one in the previous slide, and then the slow gin, but there's where it appears there. In 1920, national prohibition went into effect, banning the sale and production of alcoholic beverages. <clears throat> it lasted 13 years, and during this time, Minneapolis Brewing Company changed its name to Golden Grain Juice Company and produced soft drinks and near beer with names like Minnehaha Pale, Indian Made, and Golden Grain Juice. This city directory ad is from 1925. Meanwhile, Grain Belt beer turned up in Canada. Canadian brewery historian Bill Wright explained to me that during Prohibition, Charles and Thomas Keywell, who built the Keywell Brewery in Little Falls, Minnesota, came to St. Boniface, Manitoba to build a new brewery in 1925. There was a trademark challenge to one of their brands called Buffalo Beer, so the brand was changed to Grain Belt. Canadian Grain Belt was a dark, full-bodied beer, completely different, from Minneapolis Grain Belt, or what Minneapolis Grain Belt came to be known for after Prohibition anyway. But uh, it's kind of an interesting, kind of a similar label, but it's different, kind of like when I took trips to Canada when I was a kid, that's one of the things I noticed, that things were similar, but a little bit different, and you kind of, kind of see that there. And the two and a half percent Next page. In 1923, or excuse me, not 23, in 1933, Prohibition was repealed. <clears throat> Minneapolis Brewing Company and Grain Belt were back with a wide array of colorful packages, including the new cap-sealed can right there. But you can see on the left, more people had home refrigerators now, so bottled beer qu quickly began to outsell draught beer. Meanwhile, the Keywells returned to Minnesota, and Charles Keywell became vice president of Minneapolis Brewing Company, and his nephew, Frank Keywell, went on to run the company from the early 1950s until his retirement in 1973. And I think some of them we have out in those display cases out there right now. And here's one of the earliest post-prohibition grain belt signs with the slogans, Age the Natural Way and the Minneapolis Beer. So that's circa 1934, 1935, around then. Here's a 1930s ink blotter with a nice but rather inaccurate depiction of the brewery, particularly with the surrounding build buildings in all the wrong places. Like, for instance, the office building is facing, should be facing the brewery, but uh, it's, uh, and then they have the bottling house and the, uh, and the warehouse would actually be on, over on the other side there. It is worth noting that in the 1930s, there was a lot of labor strife in Minneapolis and other big cities, and the Grain Belt Brewery was the site of a few strikes that occasionally turned violent, especially when members of one union dared cross the picket lines of another union. There were other strikes later in the history of Grain Belt, but not nearly as volatile. 
And here's a picture taken right on the front steps of the office building across the street in 1939 of the Grain Belt Delivery Force when all was well on the labor front. You can see they uh, all had uniforms and uh, were all spiffied up and that's, uh, you know, their hats and all that and it's kind of the uh, gas station attendants tend to look like that in those days as well. In the 1940s, Greenbelt la Green labeling changed, featuring a gold label with a red diamond logo over a depiction of a bottle cap similar to that famous sign on Nicollet Island. The green bottle, a relic from World War II, has a label that says, this is your regular Greenbelt beer in a temporary bottle due to bottle shortage. And then those two small ones, those are actually salt shakers, but they have the same label, so I included them in the, uh, in the picture. And then here's uh, just another look of that World War II green bottle, which is actually pretty rare, but that's from my own collection. On June 6, 1941, at around 11 a.m., there was an armed robbery in the Minneapolis Brewing Company office building across the street. Five bandits who had ties to Chicago area gangsters, pulled up in a car. One of them stayed at, at the wheel, another stood guard at the door, while three others stormed in with sawed off shotguns and announced, this is a stick up. There was around 50 people in the building at the time and the bandits went to each office demanding money. A shot was fired into the floor as a warning to one employee to hurry up and the bullet ricocheted and hit the man in the shoulder. About $50,000 was netted from a cashier's cage. Old Jacob Coons, Minneapolis Brewing Company president and chairman of the board, who had been with the company since its inception in the 1890s, was told, come on, snap into it, we're in a hurry. Now look here, responded Coons, I don't do things in a hurry. You're getting your money, you have nothing to complain of. The robbers didn't bother checking the basement where brewery official Louis Findorf, pictured here, was tapping a keg with his brother Rudolph celebrating his 76th birthday. He heard the commotion upstairs, including the gunshot that was fired, and he and his brother did indeed have about $100 between them, but instead of panicking, he drew himself another nog and a beer. Quote, if they weren't going to come down and get it, I wasn't going to rush upstairs and hand it over, he told the Minneapolis Times with a chuckle. So, you know, Coons looks a little, look kind of grumpy, but Fendorf, he looks like he'd be a great guy to have a beer with. He looks pretty friendly. Here's a couple of newspaper ads from the 1940s. Note the new slogan, the friendly beer with the friendly flavor, which they, uh, uh, August Shell, which currently owns the Grain Belt label, uses, has been using variations of that sense. Apparently the term friendly tests well in, uh, in surveys, but... Uh, you know, there's a kind of a heyday of newspaper advertising back then. A giant neon green belt bottle cap sign was erected atop the Marigold Ballroom in 1940. In 1950, it was moved to Nicollet Island next to De La Salle High School, where it remains today as a well-loved landmark. And I'll add, I was a little unclear about this, the details of that when I wrote my book, so I'm kind of correcting the record here, that I actually did start at the top of the Marigold Ballroom and was moved over to its current location. In the four, late 40s and into the 50s, Grainbelt made another complete redesign of the labeling with a new stylized logo. Here are some examples of the early to mid 1950s packaging. Grainbelt Premium, a smoother tasting brew was first test marketed in 1947 and was so well received, it soon became part of the Grain Belt line and was heavily promoted in the 50s. Now premium came in clear bottles, original Grain Belt came in brown bottles. And now premium is considered the flagship of the product and uh, the current maker of it doesn't even bother with original Grain Belt anymore. And for a time in the early 50s, Grain Belt was even advertised in Life magazine. Not only that, they advertised the fact that it was advertised in Life magazine. <laughs> Grain Belt was promoted as America's party beer. So I'll let you look at that for a moment. Grain Belt also sponsored the Bohemian Band broadcasts 
on WNAX Radio in Yankton, South Dakota. I'll let you take a look at that there. So I mean that, and that was those. I think those bottles are probably die cuts uh, made of plywood or something like that, or maybe they're even cardboard. But uh, but that was entertainment on small town radio back in those days. And you can still hear that kind of thing in New. Uh, don't know the year, but that's roughly 1950. I mean, WNAX is still around there, longtime CBS affiliate, um, similar to WCCO. In 1954, Greenbelt television commercials featuring animated dancing glasses began to appear with a jingle that sang, It's light, it's golden Greenbelt beer. I've never seen these commercials, but there you got the... Uh, the music for the jingle, so if anybody ever wanted to try to play it themselves, there you go. But, and then dancing cartoon characters and that type of thing was kind of popular in animated commercials in the 50s. A lot, a lot of similar ads to that. In 1955, Greenbelt switched from cone top cap sealed cans to flat top cans that required a church key opener. If the can shown here looks somewhat familiar, it's the design of the current Greenbelt cans, or it's the design that the current Greenbelt cans are based on, although the structure and materials of the can are completely different. Back then, cans were made of thick steel, or, or tin-plated steel uh, with uh, you know, three pieces. They, you know, the, the can was welded together uh, at a, on, with a seam with the top and the bottom added, and now it's just all pressed aluminum with the top added and the much more lighter weight than they used to be. But there's the older cans, you know, the, uh, which were literally cap sealed, you know, the old cone tops, which are popular with beer can collectors. And there's their uh, advertising life. They were still boasting that at that time. Here in the basement tap room of the office building, Jay Raymond Fox, vice president in charge of sales, demonstrates the proper way to open and pour the new flat top cans. Easy opening tab tops are yet to come. And that, that tap room that you see in the background there, that's still there intact in the basement of the tap room, or excuse me, in the basement of the office across the street. It's really nice over there. <clears throat> but they're showing like different, or different methods, you know, open it one way for drinking, open it another way for pouring, and and all of that. In the late 50s and early 60s, Greenbelt introduced cartoon characters Stanley and Elbert in print and television advertising. Excuse me, Stanley and Elbert were fun loving billboard painters playing off, excuse me, Greenbelt's heavy use of outdoor advertising. The diamond logo received a new, more modern look, and a new slogan, It's Been a Long Time a Brewing, was introduced. And this was a card that was used uh, for point of purchase sales where the liquor store or the retailer would write in you know, how much a six pack would cost in that uh, blank space there. Here is a rare poster advertising Greenbelt sponsorship of Minneapolis Bruins minor league professional hockey on WLOL radio and on channel 11, then known as WTCN TV. The Minneapolis Bruins only lasted for two seasons from 1963 to 1965. Note the wordplay on the slogan, been a long time um, brewing. And there you see Stanley and Albert there too, having drinking while playing, which might not be recommended, might get into more fights that way. In 1963, Minneapolis Brewing Company cleaned up the fenced-in junkyard and storage area along the Broadway Avenue side of the brewery landscaped it, installed a big water fountain, and brought in tame deer, turning it into Greenbelt Park, which quickly became a popular tourist attraction. The fountain would be featured in advertising and labels. That's that pipe sticking out of the ground they showed at the beginning of the presentation. Uh, and the, the, okay, just pick up where I left off, and that fountain illustrated the slogan from Perfect Brewing Water. Greenbelt also sponsored Sunday evening outdoor classical music concerts in the area during the summers in the 60s. Greenbelt packaging further changed beginning in the late 50s and into the 1960s with a new gold label. 
16 ounce cans are in, introduced as we're easy opening pat, pull, 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 tab, pull tab cans. In May 1967, the company name changed to Greenbelt Breweries Incorporated as the company entered into a lease agreement with the Stores Brewing Company of Omaha, Nebraska with the option to buy. Greenbelt was expanding and wanted, wanted to shed the regional image. Greenbelt acquired the Howenstein brand from the former New Ulm Brewery that had closed at the end of 1969. And in 1970, Greenbelt bought stores with the intention of operating the Omaha Brewery in addition to the one in Minneapolis. But that would only last until 1972, as Greenbelt was forced to close the Omaha Brewery due to increased competition and price cutting schemes from the national breweries. Greenbelt further expanded its product line in 1970 with the introduction of GBX Malt Liquor, which was aimed at a younger beer drinking crowd. The new brew for the new breed was the slogan, and the cans were blue and silver. GBX sponsored local racing and concert events in the early 70s. And here, that, that design there that was on the cover of one of their company magazines, but that was also given away as a poster at the time. There was also a skiing themed one as well, <clears throat> but very psychedelic looking for that era. <clears throat> uh, with the release of GBX that summer, uh, the brewery threw a media party in the company tap room across the street. On the left, looks like Lee Zanin of WWTC Radio had a few. And that picture there, once again, that's in that basement tap room that we talked about before. Rainbow Park continued to be a popular tourist attraction into the 70s. To add to the aesthetic, the mural on the building was repainted to blend in a little better and to look less like an advertisement at the request of community activists. That's the same picture that we used on the flyer for this event. But, I mean, that scene, that's literally what's right outside the window over there, but all that stuff's gone now. Like I said, they got a replica fountain, but that's not the same as the fountain shown there. There's a wooden bridge. And approximately here, that wooden structure's gone, but that's where we are right now, is right around that area. <clears throat> In the late 60s and early 70s, Greenbelt, with its ad agency Knox Reeves, was known for its eye-catching billboards and magazine ads with colorful photos and clever slogans around the Twin Cities and throughout Minnesota, including these. And there's that Swallow or Pride uh, billboard that I mentioned before, and a couple other things. Here's a few more examples, all billboards from around 1973. <clears throat> One of the most famous was the one at the bottom, which seemed to suggest another Minnesota icon, the Jolly Green Giant, drank Grain Belt beer. In 1974, a campaign called The Best Things in Life Are Here was introduced, promoting both Grain Belt and its home state of Minnesota. And that's a pinback button there. Here we see the Greenbelt product line in 1974 with new colorful 12-pack cartons. Greenbelt regular and premium, white label, Howenstein, Stores Triumph, and Stores Premium. At the beginning of the decade, Greenbelt was the 18th largest brewer in the country and the best-selling beer in Minnesota, but as the decade progressed, it was losing ground to the big, <clears throat> heavily advertised national brands such as Budweiser, Pabst, Miller, and Schlitz. The company was starting to lose money. And then here's the, uh, the campaign, which I wrote about in this article, in this handout here, where I talk about who these guys are. But uh, in the spring of 1975, the Greenbelt guys, Archie, Mark, and Rennie, were introduced in a series of humorous and somewhat controversial television commercials. It would be the final ad campaign for Greenbelt Breweries Incorporated. <clears throat> Greenbelt had been a publicly traded company, but in 1974, local businessman Irwin Jacobs began buying up large shares of Greenbelt. In 1975, he made an offer to the other shareholders to buy up the company. 
After a volatile meeting, a majority of shareholders agreed to sell to him for $4.1 million, which quickly proved to be a fatal mistake. Jacobs wasn't interested in running a brewery. He was interested in redeveloping the property. After giving lip service to the idea of maintaining the brewery and making it profitable again, Jacobs almost immediately contacted Russell Cleary of the G. Heileman Brewing Company about selling off the Grain Belt labels, and he shut down the brewery at the end of 1975, eliminating some 350 local jobs. <clears throat> In June 1976, most of the equipment inside the brewery was auctioned off. Most of it sold for scrap, particularly the copper brew kettles. New equipment that had just been delivered to the brewery was immediately sold off before it could even be installed. So you can see some good interior shots there. But, uh, kind of a sad article at, at that, written by Peg Meyer, who longtime. Uh, Minneapolis Tribune writer had done a lot of really good history books for the Minnesota Historical Society. The Grain Belt brands were sold to the G. Heilman Brewing Company of La Crosse, Wisconsin. <clears throat> Heilman operated the Schmidt Brewery in St. Paul, which had been a major competitor of Grain Belt for decades. In spite of assurances by Heilman that Grain Belt would not be changed and would be supported, Heilman changed the recipe and the packaging, turning Grain Belt into a more watered-down swill and marketed it as a second-tier brand while putting much more effort into marketing Schmidt and their other brands such as Old Style and Blatt's. Although they did get WCCO radio personality Steve Cannon to endorse it in 1978. It's the Cannon mess on CCO. There was talk of turning Grain Belt, or the Grain Belt Brew House into a foreign trade zone, but Irwin Jacobs didn't want to wait around for that to happen. In the summer of 1976, bulldozers were on site, and demolition began on the brewery, taking out a section along 13th Avenue. But community activists, and more importantly, the city of Minneapolis, stepped in. Demolition was halted, and the brewery was saved. Making a long story short, the building sat empty for the next quarter century, and demolition remained a distinct possibility. In the 90s, there were some sparks of renewed interest in Grain Belt. Heilman Brewing Company, after years of opposition, agreed to finance the refurbishing of the Grain Belt bottle cap sign on Nicollet Island, restoring the neon and hundreds of incandescent bulbs in the letters, <clears throat> relighting the spectacle to its former glory. But that relighting would be short-lived, as parts of it would frequently go out and the, and the electricity bill to run it, in addition to all the repairs, was quite expensive. Then, in 1991, as Wisconsin-based Heilman found themselves in financial straits after years of fast growth, a new company called Minnesota Brewing Company was formed, buying the former Schmidt facility in St. Paul from Heilman, as well as the Greenbelt Brands, and rehiring the brewery workers that had been laid off from the St. Paul Brewery. With new emphasis on promoting Grain Belt Premium, Grain Belt production returned to Minnesota from La Crosse, Wisconsin, and the company stressed that in billboards, such as this one on Hennepin Avenue in downtown Minneapolis. Minnesota Brewing Company also made an effort to promote original Grain Belt in the brown bottles with a very attractive black label design as seen in this wanted poster. <clears throat> this is I think that copyright on there is 1998, looks like. And in 1993, Minnesota Brewing celebrated Grain Belt's 100th anniversary, reviving an old logo and old slogan, been a long time of brewing. Stanley and Albert even appeared in some of the 100th anniversary promotions. Meanwhile, renovations started happening at the old brewery in Northeast Minneapolis. The buildings have been declared a historic landmark, and after Irwin Jacobs sold the property to the Minneapolis Community Development Agency, repairs were made to the brew house as the agency looked at ways to redevelop the site. A lot of potential developers looked at it and, bought and balked at the odd architecture and the expense of bringing it up to current code, not to mention the asbestos, PCBs, and lead paint that would have to be removed. Uh, I don't, I don't know. It, it, 
I don't know how much how, how much Jacob sold it, but it wasn't from what I recall. It was, it was very little. He probably gave it away because he was all those years he wanted to redevelop the property. He wanted to just tear the thing down, but he was stopped from doing that from the historic preservationists. But meanwhile, he had to still keep paying property taxes on it, so he was quite happy to just rid himself of it. Then in 2000, Ryan Companies and RSP Architects stepped in, turning the 19th century brewery into a 20th cent 21st century world headquarters for the architect firm, opening in 2002. The Pierre Botano Library, then part of the Minneapolis Public Library chain, moved to the former brewery Gast House, or Guest House. They, there was a sign above the entrance that G-A-S-T-H-A-U-S, which is German for Guest House. Uh, and wagon shed breweries on the Broadway side where the old Greenbelt Park used to be. <clears throat> also in 2002, as Minnesota Brewing Company crashed and burned after a decade in business, the August Shell Brewing Company of New Ulm purchased the Greenbelt brands with a new marketing effort for Greenbelt that hadn't been seen since the days of the Minneapolis brewery. With several different brews being made under the Greenbelt brand, it's not really the same Greenbelt as it was before, but the heritage lives on, and Shell is far more dedicated to promoting Green Belt than Minnesota Brewing or Heilman ever were. Incidentally, I actually wrote a couple of paragraphs pertaining to Green Belt in this Shell's pamphlet from from 2005 as part of an article I had submitted to them for uh, for their website. So it's like those two those two paragraphs I actually wrote. Finally, on December 30th, 2017, in time for Greenbelt's 125th anniversary, the Greenbelt bottle cap sign on Nicollet Island was relit once again, this time using LED technology, making it brighter than it was before, at far less expense and less need for repairs. Hopefully it will burn bright for decades to come. <clears throat> 